the Senate Committee on Natural Resources will now come to order. Will the Secretary please call roll? Senator Flores? Present. Senator Hansen? Here. Senator Gogachia? Here. Chair Pazina? Here. Senator Scheibel? Thank you so much. We have a quorum with all five members present. Before we begin today, I'd like to provide some general housekeeping reminders. Please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Otherwise, Senator Hansen will come down from the dais and answer your phone. The public is advised that during meetings, legislators and staff are using laptops to view bills and exhibits and not for personal reasons. We're trying to be as paper free as possible, although admittedly with the number of handouts, you would never know it. Please don't think this is a sign of inattention or disrespect if you see us on our laptops. Please note that we require everyone to submit exhibits in an electronic format the day prior to the meeting, and thank you to our presenters for doing that today. A few reminders about testifying before committee. We do ask that you sign in at the table by the door. You give the committee secretary your business card if you have one prior to testifying. And even if you're not testifying, you may want to sign in so that there's a record of who is interested in a particular bill or presentation in case the committee needs to reach out to you at a later date. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and spell your name and share your affiliation, if any, for the record. Then turn the microphone off each time that you've completed speaking. If you have handouts for the committee, you're asked to provide 10 hard copies to the committee secretary for use by the public. We will be taking public comment at the end of each meeting. We'll be limiting public comment to two minutes per person to ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak. Please feel free to provide any additional comments in writing to the committee secretary so that they may be added to the record. And a reminder for public comment that it should have nothing to do with the bills that are presented here today, though you'll have ample time to speak regarding those bills during the hearing. Today, we're going to be hearing Senate Bill 77 and Senate Bill 180, as well as receiving a presentation from University of Nevada, Reno, College of Agriculture, Biotechnology, and Natural Resources, as well as from the director of the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology. But today, we're going to begin with a bill hearing for Senate Bill 77. I'll now open the hearing on Senate Bill 77. Please come up to the front when you're ready to present. Thank you. This bill revises provisions relating to the Nevada State Board of Geographic Names. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Pazina and members of the Senate Committee on Natural Resources. For the record, my name is Christine Johnson, and I am the Executive Secretary of the Nevada State Board on Geographic Names. I'm also the Executive Secretary for the Council of Geographic Names Authorities, and I serve as adjunct faculty at the University of Nevada in the Departments of Anthropology and Geography, and I was recently appointed by the Secretary of the Interior to the Federal Advisory Panel on the Reconciliation and Place Names for our country by Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland. I appreciate the opportunity to in introduce and provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 77, which might be one of the least complicated but more socially important legislative proposals for you to consider this legislative session. SB 77 simply proposes to provide a per diem allowance and travel expenses for the Nevada State Board on Geographic Names members. The Nevada State Board on Geographic Names, or NSBGN, was established in 1985 and is comprised today of representatives from UNR, UNLV, the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology, the Nevada Department of Transportation, the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Nevada State Library, Archives and Public Records, the Nevada Historical Society, the Intertribal Council of Nevada, the Nevada Indian Commission, and three federal agencies, which include the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, and National Park, uh, National Park Service. The NSBGN, since its organization, manages the state's place names in coordination with the federal government. The board meets three times a year in public and open meeting forum and has until recently been a largely unnoticed board and since its beginning in 1985 has been unfunded. P but place names are becoming one of the most important social dialogues in our nation. The NSBGN is now tasked with recommending changes to any racially discriminatory geographic place, names, uh, place name on the state's landscape. As a result of Assembly Bill 88 from the 81st session of the legislature passed in May of 2021. I'm proud to say that Nevada passed this bill six months ahead of federal orders that were issued by the Secretary of the Interior that same year. However, much of what the Nevada Board now has to manage as a result of this state action 
uh, of 2021 requires increased and direct communications with our public and more importantly, our tribal communities. The 12 members of this board who have full-time jobs in the agencies that they represent do not have funding to complete the required travel or secure other resources without impacting the budgets of the agencies they represent. Examples of this include members paying personally for postage, gas to travel to meetings out of the local area, and other, another more significant ex example is the University of Nevada, Reno, recently agreeing to absorb the cost of redeveloping and hosting the webpage for the NSBGN, and is working currently to align the past website with current requirements of the university system to meet accessibility standards. Without this support, the NSBGN would be even more restricted, invisible, and ineffective. In summation, in order to be able to do what is now legislatively assigned to this board, we are requesting that the NSBGN members who can participate in outreach and consultation opportunities across the state be allowed compensation in the form of per diem and uh, per diem allowance and associated travel expenses, which is what is presented here in SB 77. Additionally, I would at this time respectfully request that SB 77 be amended to add the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as this would add the only remaining federal agency associated with Nevada lands not currently represented on the Nevada board. This request is supported by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and is also fully supported by the current NSBGN representatives. This completes my testimony, and I would be happy to answer any questions at this time. Wonderful. Any other presenters joining you today? Okay. Any questions from the committee? Senator Scheibel. Thank you. At the end, you mentioned that you wanted to add a representative from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and so um, would that be an amendment that you'd be bringing us before work session? Yes, um, I have submitted a letter that I think is part of the handouts uh, that's on the table. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. I do have the letter. Okay. Um, I just wanted to confirm that it was your intent well, to amend the language um, of SB 77 yes, yeah. and um, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And if you can provide that in digital format as well to our committee secretaries, we'll get that downloaded into Nellis as well. Thank you. The, the letter is on Nellis. Is it now? Okay. Yeah, it is. Great. Sorry to clarify. The letter is on Nellis. I just haven't seen language of an amendment, which I understand probably doesn't exist yet, but you've just confirmed that it will exist before a work session. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. And once that amendment exists, if you provide it to our committee secretary, we'll get that downloaded and we'll be ready to include that when it comes time for a work session. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not as, I have a little more technology challenge here, so it takes me a bit more. I, I guess I'm typically a federal, federal agent isn't allowed to accept even, even a lunch or per diem. So I'm, I'm kind of confused. Okay, we're going to put U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a voting member, but then we, when we get into sub five here, uh, you're entitled to per diem expenses. Typically, a government, a federal government agency isn't allowed to do that. I understand. And the way it's written, the way I understand it, it Please would do, do share your name for the record, and thank you so much. Sorry, this is Christine Johnson uh, for Senate Bill 77, the Nevada State Board on Geographic Names. Um, I understand, and the way I understand the way the bill is currently written, it, it would be only per diem uh, reimbursed to the state uh, agency representatives. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. We are going to look for testimony in support of Senate Bill 77. So if you'd like to take a seat, you, you're off the hot seat for a moment, and thank you so much. Anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in support? Seeing no one here in Carson City, BPS, do we have anyone on the phone lines? Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition of SB 77? And seeing no one racing to the front, anyone on the phone lines, BPS? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. 
All right, let's take a gamble. Is there anyone who'd like to testify in neutral on Senate Bill 77 here in Carson City? BPS on the phones. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Would you like to come back up and give any closing statement or are you satisfied with where we left things? <laughs> I wouldn't come back to the hot seat either. No. Thank you so much. With that said, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill number 77, and we will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 180, which revises the provisions relating to groundwater boards. Um, with that said, Senator Goakachia, and any presenters that you have, please head to the front, and thank you. Members of the, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Senator Goikichia representing Senate District 19 for the record. Uh, I'm bringing Senate Bill 180 today and it pertains to groundwater boards. And just a little fast history on this. Uh, in the early 90s when I was on a board of county commissioners, we did request a groundwater board under the existing statute. And uh, of course that requires then it, the governor's approval and uh, that's why I brought the bill list. Uh, again, that was for Diamond Valley, and in the last 30 years since, we've seen some, you know, continued problems there. So again, we were denied by the governor in 1990. This just facilitates the process in SB 180, and uh, as with any bill, I do have a kind of a <laughs> open with a question. I'm not too sure, and we don't have legal here today, but I do want to make sure on the record that we are talking about in order for a groundwater board to be requested by a board of county commissioners, it has to be a designated basin. It's kind of confusing as you look at the text and it talks about an area designated as a groundwater basin. But again, I'm not sure if that's truly a groundwater basin, a designated groundwater basin. And uh, that'll bring us to another bill later in the week, you know, what you need to be to be a designated basin. But anyway, I want to make sure that it has to be a designated basin, would be eligible for a basin assessment in order for you to request a groundwater board. And uh, I have with me Jeff Fontaine from Central Nevada Water Authority, and uh, a lot of their membership is very supportive of this bill. Uh, really, the long and short of it, you would request to the state engineer, the Board of County Commissioners would request of the state engineer to impose a, a groundwater board. Uh, it would be comprised of seven members. They are selected by, by the state engineer. A majority of four of them have to be water right, water right holders. One has to be the majority water right holder. And, uh, and then one non-voting member can be selected by the Board of County Commissioners. The real intent of this, it allows for public input in a basin that's struggling or having some issues. It allows for public input that come from the local government side uh, and again designated by the state engineer and uh, there is another correction I think Mr. Fontaine will bring that up uh, we t it talks is about reducing over pumping we want to stop over pumping in groundwater basins but I think uh, Mr. Fontaine will address that bottom line is it's, it's just a simple bill uh, I'm concerned about how effective it's going to be it's only for four years you're you're on the board for four years. At the end of four years, the board goes away unless you request uh, from the state engineer that uh, he re-up you for another four. So bottom line is it, it's just a tool that would allow some local input. Uh, clearly, it's not subject, again, to judicial review and has no mandate in it that requires that any direction from this local groundwater board be followed by the state engineer. He just has to accept it and consider it. And again, we're hopeful that some of these local communities with the groundwater board could bring some good ideas forward on how to deal with an overappropriated basin. So with that, I'll stand for questions and shouldn't take us long. Thank you so much, Senator. So will you be providing an amendment for us as well with um, what you just specified a moment ago? Yes, I think we'll clean it up, but I'll, uh, if, if it's uh, with the board's uh, chair's permission, uh, I'll let J uh, Mr. Fontaine go ahead and do his presentation and we might find another glitch. I haven't, I haven't listened to what he has to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Pazina, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Jeff Fontaine, 
and I serve as the Executive Director of the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority, and I want to thank you for hearing Senate Bill 180 and to Senator Gokachia for his sponsorship. So as Senator Gokachia indicated, SB 180 amends uh, NRS 534.035, governing county groundwater boards uh, for groundwater basins that are designated by the state engineer pursuant to NRS 534.030 as requiring supervision. Uh, th this was first enacted in 1961 with AB 437, which created the Las Vegas Valley Groundwater Board, which advised and made recommendations to the state engineer on the management of the Las Vegas Groundwater Basin until 1971, when the first phase of the Southern Nevada Water Project was completed. Since then, um, the statute was amended three times, and to our knowledge, no other county groundwater board has ever been created. So under current law, if a board of county commissioners wants to create a groundwater board, it must first be approved uh, by the state engineer and its members must be appointed by the governor. Current law also requires a state engineer to confer with the groundwater board and to obtain its written advice before making any management decision essentially in the groundwater basin. So these, these existing requirements are really an impediment to creating any new groundwater board it's, as the law currently exists. So just quickly walking through the bill, section one, Subsection 2 enables the Board of County Commissioners to create a groundwater board by making a request to the state engineer who then would appoint the seven members based on the priority and quality, quantity of the water rights that they hold in that particular designated basin. Subsection 3 provides uh, that in addition to the members appointed by the state engineer, the Board of County Commissioners may appoint a non-voting member to the groundwater board. Subsection 5 makes clear that the groundwater board uh, meetings or, or public meetings, so they would be subject to Nevada's open meeting law. Subsection 8 removes the requirement, again, under existing law for the state engineer to confer with the groundwater board before approving a water right application, a well drilling permit, or an issue, an order, or regulation for the basin, and instead requires the um, state engineer to simply consider the written advice and recommendations uh, of the groundwater board on reducing uh, or over pumping um, in the basin. And the language that exists, as it exists today is uh, consider um, the recommendations of the board on reducing over pumping. We, wanna, we would like to add uh, or preventing over pumping uh, as an amendment, which we'll submit officially for the record as well. Um, moving on very quickly in section, um, oh, also in section eight, uh, it makes clear also that um, any decision of the state engineer doesn't that doesn't comply with the recommendation of the board is not subject to judicial review. Section one, uh, subsection nine, uh, sunsets the groundwater board after four years unless the board of county commissioners requests that the state engineer approve an additional four year term. And it also provides uh, that the board can dissolve, be dissolved by a majority of, uh, vote of its members. And then finally, uh, section two removes uh, any uh, reference to state funding for the groundwater board. So uh, just to sort of sum this up, we, we believe strongly that allowing counties to create uh, groundwater boards for designated basins is, is uh, both proactive and appropriate, and we, we believe can really lead to some place-based solutions to local problems. So with that, again, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, help present SB 180 and stand ready to answer any questions. All right, Senator Scheibel is going to start us off with some questions. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly that we are now taking the governor's approval out of the process. Uh, for the record, Jeff Fontaine, that, that is correct. Okay, and separate unrelated question um, about the four-year terms of the board. Okay. But you'll have to remind me the relationship between the groundwater management board and the groundwater management plan, um, if there is one, or if they just have very similar names. Uh, Senator Gorkichia, for the record, uh, there's nothing required between this board and a groundwater management plan, although I would s assume they would, it, if there was a groundwater management plan being proposed, they would at least review it and uh, offer their recommendation to the state engineer, but there's no real connection. Okay, uh, that was, if I may, mm -hmm. that was my thinking too, and I think that we just heard a bill a couple weeks ago about having a 10-year 
um, review of the groundwater management plan. And so I'm wondering if the four-year term of the groundwater management board is designed to fit into that 10 years, or like you said, they're, they're separate entities anyway, so we don't need to try to align those terms. Senator Gorkachia, for the record, that's correct. There is, there's no connection between one is there to offer advice, the other the critical management area in the 10 years, that's under the state engineer. Okay, sorry, one more question. And um, reading into section two regarding the appointment of the membership, um, and you may have addressed this, I apologize if I missed it, but it, it looks to me like it doesn't explicitly call for the county to make recommendations or make requests of the engineer regarding who they would appoint to the management board, but um, is it fair to assume that there would be some communication? The state engineer is empowered to accept recommendations, work with county commissioners to determine who he or she appoints to the board? Senator Gorkachia, for the record, uh, yes, there's no requirement that they, the county do, do in fact submit those names, but I would assume, again, uh, the state engineer would be reaching out to the county as they did request it, and uh, there is a, the sideboards on it. You have to be four members uh, that hold certificates or permits to appropriate water from the basin, and uh, with senior with senior dates of priority, that, and the state engineer in fact calls those out, uh, you know, by priority. So they have to be four members have to be senior water rights, uh, two members uh, are junior rights, and the one member, whether he's junior or senior, that's the major water right holder. Thank you so much. And I believe that was Senate Bill 113 that we were discussing that had the groundwater plan. Um, am I correct? Senator Gorkachia, for the record, yes. Critical okay. management areas are Senate Bill 113. Thank you so much. And on Section 9, um, I noticed, and this is really in regards to dissolution of the board, um, must I noticed that Section A mentioned it should be dissolved four years after the date such a board is established by the state engineer unless the state engineer approved a request from the Board of County Commissioners. Is there any way that if the Board of County Commissioners um, didn't make such a request and the state engineer felt like this group was really, groundwater board was really making progress, that that groundwater board could continue without the request from the county commissioners? Senator Gorkachia, for the record, probably a good question for legal. I would assume, though, that if uh, they were making headway, the Board of County Commissioners would be the first to request to the state engineer that they continue, which is allowed. You, you can re-up after four years and do it again. And if they were making any kind of headway, I don't think either side, the commissioners or the state engineer, would say no. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions from the committee? Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, the, you guys almost seem to go overboard on making, this is strictly an advisory committee. I mean, and then you got in here, if there is any disagreement between the state engineer and the groundwater board, the views of the state engineer shall prevail, and there's no judicial review. I mean, it's like, this is strictly an advisory board of local people to, to advise in, in the matters kind of as a go between between the commissioners it sounds like and the state engineer's office but it has absolutely zero I mean you can't use it as judicial decision you know can't sue the state engineer over it it's a hundred percent strictly advisory correct Senator Gorkachia for the record uh, unfortunately that's existing statute and uh, no 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 the blue I read a decision <laughs> of the state engineer to not comply with the views of the groundwater board is not subject to judicial review yeah. No. Oh, oh, I see where you're at. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I thought you were. Uh, again, the state engineer appoints them. We're not trying to be heavy handed with anybody. You... <sighs> oh, my God. You're just trying to basically get some local involvement on the decision making, I, but it's, it's strictly an advisory. They, they don't have any power whatsoever over the state engineer's decision, not even an opportunity for a judicial review. Well, yes, and I think we were very careful about that. We, you don't want the county and the state engineer to end up in court over a groundwater board. It, it, it's strictly advisory, and that's what we're trying to keep it to. It, it's always been that way, and, but it was even hard to get them seated, uh, you know, so that's a all. little public input. I just want to make sure because, that. yeah, there's like no, there's no 
dispute, and these have this has no power. It's strictly advisory. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Gorkachia, for the record, that's why I think Sub B comes into it uh, may be dissolved by a majority vote of the Groundwater Board at a meeting. Probably about a, you know a couple of years into it, they'll say. Okay, we're done. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but that's why there is the ability for that to happen as well. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none. Is there? Are there any further presenters or any? Okay, then we're going to have you step away. Probably you're very relieved to be doing that right now, um, and we will look for testimony and support. Anyone who has testimony in support of SB 180, please step up, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Steve Walker. I represent Eureka County. Eureka County is in support of SB 180. Uh, it clarifies and bolsters groundwater boards. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Kyle Rohrink, Executive Director of the Great Basin Water Network. We support SB 180. And I think one important thing to consider here is that uh, in a designated basin, designated under uh, 534030, you can also have fees uh, levied by the, uh, by the state engineer. And so this gives the ability uh, for uh, folks who are being assessed fees to come together uh, at a table and you know discuss the further administration of a basin um, that is experiencing likely drawdown and so I think it makes a lot of sense and we thank you for your time chair members of the committee for the record my name is Doug Busselman I'm the executive vice president of Nevada Farm Bureau we have a number of water related policies which draw attention to the importance of local engagement our support for SB 180 is based on this foundation we have a specific policy which states that the Division of Water Resources needs to be more engaged with underground water right owners to assist in improving water management. In our view, the formation of a local groundwater board will provide the uh, consistent structure to make these engagements more effective. We ask your support for SB 180. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Chauncey Chow on behalf of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. We are in support of this bill. Appreciate uh, the sponsor uh, going through the bill. We think it's a good policy and appreciate you hearing it. <laughs> we did say it was a hot seat. Yeah, it's a low seat, too. Uh, Wade Polson, Lincoln County Water District. We are in support of SB 180. Uh, we agree with everything that has been said. We believe that local input is an important piece to water and uh, have the people that are using the water and their livelihoods are based upon the water um, should have input, um, at least uh, for the state engineer to consider. And so we believe in the groundwater boards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jacob Brinkerhoff, last name B-R-I-N-K-E-R-H-O-F-F. -F. I, I serve as the Natural Resources Manager for the Nevada Association of Counties. Our members include all 17 counties in the state. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on SB 180 and would like to thank Senator Gokachia for bringing the bill forward. Um, NICO is in support of SB 180 as it streamlines and provides clarity to previously approved groundwater board formation processes. We believe this enabling legislation is a benefit to our members and would be, that would be seeking to establish these boards and to engage in meaningful collaboration with the state engineer on the management of critical groundwater resources in their local jurisdictions. Uh, with that, I'll keep it short and sweet and just echo the uh, previous testimonies as well. Thanks again for the opportunity to testify, and we appreciate your support on SB 180. Thank you very much to everyone who's testified in support. Do we have anyone else in the room in Carson City who'd like to testify in support? BPS, anyone on the phones? Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. 
Thank you so much. With that, is there anyone who would like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 180 here in Carson City? BPS, anyone on the phones who'd like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 180? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. All right, anyone here in neutral? Our state engineer himself. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Adam Sullivan, Nevada State Engineer, here to testify neutral on SB 180. Okay, the, the intent of this bill is, is, a, is a good one. It's for state, the state regulator to cooperate with local uh, entities, the people who are using the water, to develop good plans on how to reduce commitments where that's necessary. I agree with that. Um, where there's a need to reduce pumping, it's critical that the state is engaged with the people who are affected by that so that you come up with a, with a good strategy that's not overly harmful, that's effective, that's supported by the data. That is, that is a mission that is, I am entirely on board with, and I think it's the right way to do it. <clears throat> um, it's, we have a lot of data that we can share. Um, it's important to communicate what the options are for local communities under water law and what the benefits might be of different, different strategies. Um, there's, there's a couple points I wanna make. The first is that um, with regard to the intent to have place-based solutions to local problems, which is, which is uh, from Mr. Fontaine, I, I like that. And, and counties, there's already the ability for counties or local organizations to accomplish that. And there's a number of examples all around the state where we have groups um, that, that, in my view, can do what's envisioned by this bill. Um, so some examples are um, some counties have water districts that are established that have similar objectives to track water issues, groundwater issues within the county. Um, there's regional water authorities, the Humboldt River Basin Water Authority, Central Nevada Regional Water Authority, that's a group of, of, of local county commissioners or water users who are interested in accomplishing some of the same goals. Um, where there's a critical management area and a groundwater management plan, and this gets to Senator Scheibel's question, that's a, that's a different situation where you have that <clears throat> specific designation for a basin and the local community can come, can or must develop a groundwater management plan. And part of that, in the one example that we have in the state, is to come up, is to develop a local groundwater advisory board. Um, and that's specific to the basin. Um, so that, in my view, that's a very similar um, concept. Um, that we've also had success just working with local irrigators in basins that have groundwater drawdown problems. And um, the intent there is to share the data, again, talk about what the options are within water law, and then say, look, we have a couple of options. <laughs> and, and once the, you know, the, the irrigators are understanding what the options are and the implications of doing something or doing nothing, that has been a measure that we've had um, success with accomplishing some of the same goals. So my second point, and I'll be quick, um, is that this is a process that is um, initiated by, by counties that require action at a groundwater basin scale. And most of the time, groundwater basins span county lines. And one of the, you know, the example is Eureka County, which has 17 different groundwater basins, but there's only one that's entirely within Eureka County. So I have some question about uh, administratively or procedurally how that, how that might work out with, with county boundaries. And, and my last point is about um, funding. And um, so we're creating a process, a new process for the state engineer to establish the board at the discretion of the county, but there, it's, it's, there isn't a clear way of how that would be funded um, going forward. And that's my final point, thank you. 
Thank you so much. As you are the state engineer, and, and this bill definitely pertains to you in a large part, are there any questions from the committee for the state engineer? Okay. Thank you so much. And, and I would encourage your office to work closely with the senator and the sponsors of the bill um, to answer some of those questions. Thank you very much. All right. Um, good evening, Micheline Fairbank, Deputy Administrator with the Division of Water Resources. And so I wanted to touch on another element of the um, of the proposed legislation uh, testifying neutral, but um, an area of concern with respect to Section 1, Subsection 8. Um, it's the language that um, Senator Hansen had previously noted that a decision of the state engineer um, uh, that does not comply with the views of the groundwater board is not subject to judicial review. This raises a lot of questions and concerns for our office because every decision in order of the state engineer is subject to judicial reviews pursuant to NRS 533-450. So the question comes is, is this intended to, um, you know, make NRS 533-450 inapplicable to a decision of the state engineer that is based upon a recommendation of a um, groundwater board um, you know, developed under the statute, and it's then completely not subject to judicial review. There is some ambiguity with respect to how the application of that is. Um, I don't believe that that's the intent of the legislation, but the other concern is that this particular language would certainly increase the likelihood of challenges to decisions of the state engineer. While the groundwater board, if that's the intent of the language, is that the groundwater board cannot sue the state engineer for not agreeing with their recommendation. That, that distinction or where a groundwater board may make a recommendation that the state engineer doesn't adopt then will become a basis in which people can challenge the state engineer's decision as being arbitrary and capricious and not supported by substantial evidence. And our concern is that this is also going to increase litigation, is going to increase the costs of litigation, including additional expenses for the agency. And so that's a significant concern on our part. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else here in Carson City who'd like to testify in neutral? BPS, anyone on the phones? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Senator Gokachia, would you like to give any closing remarks? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate you hearing the, the bill, and uh, we will work uh, with the state engineer on on a couple of his questions. I can see maybe, uh, and we agree, there are basins that are bisected by county lines, but again, where he's making the appointment from the Board of County Commissioners, I think those water right holders, again, are in that basin, whether they they live in one county or the other. They could clearly sit on that groundwater board, depending on their priority of their water right, and the in fact, if they were one of the four major water right holders or the two junior or, you know, the at-large largest, if they if the at-large in the basin, the largest water right holder lives in another county, well, clearly you have to put him on this groundwater board. I don't see it, that as, a, as an obstacle uh, as far as language pertaining to the litigation part of it. I thought it was pretty clear that uh, the state engineer it's not subject, his ruling is not, whatever he decides on in a basin is not subject to judicial review, and I don't see where, uh, you know, if it's a bad decision, well, surely it's going to be sued by some, he will be sued by somebody else, but I don't see the tie to this groundwater board. Again, I think a good tool, it allows public input in an issue that's near and dear to all of us. With that, thank you. Thank you so much, Senator, and I'm sure there will be conversations with DCNR and the state engineer as we move forward, um, as well as conceptual amendments based on our discussion here today prior to work session. So thank you so much. With that, we will close the bill hearing on Senate Bill 180, and we have some presentations we're looking forward to here today. So with that, we'll now be receiving a presentation from Dr. Jake D. Decker, the Director of Extension and Associate Dean for Engagement with the University of Nevada, Reno, College of Agriculture, Biotechnology, and Natural Resources. We welcome you up to the seat and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Okay. 
Good afternoon, Sheila Bray for the record from University of Nevada, Reno. Chair Pazina and members of the Senate Natural Resources Community just, Committee just wanted to thank you for allowing us to present to you today. We have two of our statewide organizations and agencies um, that are affiliated with UNR here to tell you a little bit more about them. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Dr. D. Decker. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Jake D. Decker, D-E-D-E-C-K-E-R, Director of Extension, Associate Dean for Engagement with the College of Agriculture, Biotechnology, and Natural Resources within University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, thank you for welcoming our presentation today on the college and, and the ways that we serve in this area. So the College of Ag and Biotechnology and Natural Resources, or CABNR, in which I will refer to it, uh, really has a wide scope. So we talk about from molecules to landscapes to agricultural to wildlife and a number of things in between. You see here are highlighted a couple of different programs that we focus on, agriculture, veterinary rangeland sciences, biochemistry, of course natural resources, and nutrition and dietetics. We are home to over 1,300 enrolled students and have 325 faculty and staff engaged not just within the University of Reno but across the state, over 600 total uh, serving the college and in our mission. So as Nevada's original land-grant university and really our mission is to, to use research, education, and outreach within these areas to serve Nevada and all of these key elements um, that really impact us, we do that by being present in the state. So we have 20 extension offices across Nevada. We have over 10 experiment stations that are conducting research in all of these areas across the state of Nevada. And we're also proud to say that we have two 4-H youth development camps. We have one at Lake Tahoe, and we now have one in Alamo in Lincoln County, serving the youth across the state, providing experiential education, and serving them in areas of natural resources, agriculture, food, as well as in life skill development. So happy to serve across the state within those spaces. Extension is the outreach arm. It's the primary outreach arm of the university, of the college, bringing the research and scholarship that exists at the university and making sure it doesn't stay there, where it applies and is connected to across the state, helping families, producers, businesses, and ranchers make informed decisions to help them be successful in their walks of life. You see our six, seven major areas that are there, six major areas that are there, um, which we're proud of and we've served for, for many decades, but I'll say that as proud as we are in this and something we'll continue to invest in, I think where we add value is really working in partnership to saying what are the major issues? What are barriers and boundaries we're facing as a state today? And how can we partner together? How can we help bring the scholarship, the research and knowledge base from the university and apply them directly to these issues facing Nevada so that we can find solutions together? So that's what I'm excited about, continue focusing on these areas, but really looking at partnering together to address the most critical issues facing our state today. Our ag agriculture experiment station, agriculture continues to be a leading industry within this state. Uh, we do research around biotechnology, crops, animals, uh, climate, weather, natural resources, and all the elements that are important to us. And certainly the two pictures that we have here, the one at the top is a desert farming initiative uh, that's located right here in Reno, around five acres. Uh, we do research on 90 different varieties of fruits and vegetables on this facility, and there's about 15 to 20 tons of produce that's provided to food pantries, um, and in different areas providing wholesale food to the community at large. So really excited about the research that's done there, but also producing food for those in need. The lower picture is, uh, is from Rafter 7. Uh, it is the Great Basin Research and Extension Center. That is sheep that is known for its wool quality, for its meat quality, and some very innovative products. So we're excited to conduct research in that space and those environments unique to the Western region. It's just two examples of what those research um, centers throughout the state can accomplish. Collaboration, that is what we are. Partnerships, connecting, network. Because we exist across the state, we have a vast network of resources, of supports that we can provide to Nevada. So, and also connecting to various different audiences. We wanna serve all the people in Nevada, not just for some individuals, but all individuals. So we engage uh, tribes, we engage around food sovereignty and connecting partners together. So while sometimes we might not have faculty that specialize in an area that we need the most research in, Likely we know who does, and we can make those connections 
across the state or nationally or international, bringing those individuals to the table and help us deal with the issues that we need to be dealt with. Natural resources, of course, you all hear issues on a number of different fronts that come across your desk, whether it's fire, water and drought, climate, and all these different aspects. And I want to share with you that this is a major effort of our college as well. And so we have faculty researching in these areas. They're doing applied research, outreach, and education within these spaces. The state, cli state climatologist has an extension appointment. So we are directly engaged within climate work that's occurring within the state. And I hope as, as you individuals see the different policies and things come across, I hope you see us as a resource, as an element of scholarship, of research that we can come to the table, partner together. We want to be able to help work in collaboration to solve some of these different issues that we're facing. And we're excited to engage all of our faculty around these different areas. So happy to talk with you today about a little bit what we do as a college extension experiment station and how I think we can continue to serve as a resource to you all as we move our state forward. But now I'd like to pivot to Dr. Jim Fowles, who's going to talk about his important work. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, good afternoon, uh, Jim Falls, uh, for the record, uh, that's uh, l uh, the last name is spelled F-A-U-L-D-S. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to present before you today. Um, so I am a director of the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology, which is your state geological survey. And let's see here. Uh, so the MBMG mission is typical of a state geological survey. You can think of us as a Bureau of Analysis, Information and Exchange on Nevada Geology, and or its natural resources, its geologic hazards. In other words, applied geology and unbiased science for the public good. Uh, MBMG is a public service unit within the College of Science at the University of Nevada, Reno, but we serve every corner of the state and do just as much work in Southern Nevada, for example, as we do in Northern Nevada. Nearly every state has a state geological survey, which complements and works uh, collaboratively with the U.S. Geological Survey as well as, as well as other state agencies. So the main objectives of, uh, of the Bureau and other state geological surveys are, is to analyze our geologic framework, and we do that. I'll show you an example uh, uh, with detailed geologic mapping across the state. We assess our natural resources. We also assess our geologic hazards. And very important, we archive and disseminate that geologic data so that it's available to everyone, industries, uh, general public, et cetera. And since we're part of the university, we also uh, play a role in education, educating the next generation, if you will, on Nevada's natural resources, geologic hazards, uh, um, et cetera. So in all total, we're about 30 employees, uh, faculty and staff. More than 10 of those are funded by uh, external grants. So you can think again, our overarching goals are to enhance public safety and facilitate an environmentally sound uh, economic development across the state. So here's an example of geologic mapping. Again, this is a foundation, sort of think of it as two-dimensional representations of complex three-dimensional geology. So the primary goals, it, it is a primary goal of any state geological survey, essential for analyzing our natural resources and geologic hazards. In an independent study of geologic mapping conducted uh, for Nevada back in 2014, it was found that every allocated to the Bureau for geologic mapping returns greater than 50 times that in benefits to the state. But as we look at the state over on the right in the areas that are covered by detailed geologic maps, only about 30% of the state is covered, so there's much more to do. Uh, and because of uh, the uh, uh, amount of staff we have, for example, we have about eight or nine geologists working across this vast state. We focus on three primary areas of the state, Southern Nevada, uh, uh, the Reno-Carson City area, and also Northeast Nevada because of its, uh, uh, the extent of mineral and energy resources in that part of the state. 
And there's two examples of geologic maps here. The one on the lower left is from the Carlin area, and that includes some of the largest gold mines in the state, and for that matter, in the world. And the one uh, center, in the center is a draft geologic map, a new geologic map of Las Vegas Valley, which shows all of the earthquake faults. Also, those various colors represent various deposits associated with potential flood hazards. And that map we hope to release by the end of this uh, calendar year. So an example of what we do with mineral resources, a lot of that is handled through the Center for Research and Economic Geology, which is part of the Bureau. We all know that Nevada has a vast, is, is very well endowed with mineral resources. Uh, and we commonly lead the nation in uh, non-fuel mineral production. In a typical year, we're a leader in, in gold production. In fact, we're the fifth largest gold producer in the world, but we're also a leader in various other minerals, strategic minerals, for example, such as lithium, and, and, and produce a lot of other minerals as well. So what role does MBMG play in that? We play a role in discovery of new deposits, uh, uh, developing methods for more efficient exploration, and then we produce a number of products that are critical for analyzing mineral resources across the state. The geologic maps I mentioned, uh, detailed studies of individual ore deposits, analyses of how ore ores form in a particular environment. And then in the, in the center here, you see various reports that we produce on an annual basis. And the, the bar graph on the bottom shows the production of various minerals and, and various types of resources uh, over the past uh, uh, really um, multiple decades. And that large gold uh, bar, if you will, indicates the amount of gold production in the state. Uh, and we also play a role, again, in educating uh, undergraduate and graduate students in understanding our mineral resources and are a direct pipeline into ver various industries in the state. So um, there's a lot of talk today about lithium resources, and for good reason. Uh, this is one of the 50 critical minerals, as defined by the USGS, essential to the economic and uh, national security. Of course, it's used for uh, batteries, for electrical automobiles, also for power storage, but also for uh, various alloys for the aerospace industry. Global production has increased dramatically over the past several years, and Nevada plays a very critical role in that. That, that map uh, in the upper center is a map of lithium deposits in the U.S., color-coded. The red and the larger circles are the larger lithium deposits, and you can see that Nevada contains the largest lithium deposits in the U.S., and for mat that matter, some of the largest deposits in the world. We have the primary lithium uh, producing operation in the country in uh, Clayton Valley, uh, producing lithium from Bryan's. That produces about 5,000 metric tons a year. The Tesla factory alone uses almost 25,000 and metric tons annually. So we really have to import most of the lithium that we need in this country right now, uh, as well as the other strategic and critical minerals. So the Bureau plays a critical role in this uh, by producing good geologic maps. That map on the far right is a map of the Thacker Pass area in northern Nevada that we produced several years ago that was key to lithium exploration in the area. Uh, and we're also in the uh, lower, the map in the lower center indicates areas where we're conducting research on various lithium deposits in the state as we speak. Uh, geothermal resources are also very important for the state. Uh, Nevada has more geothermal resources than any other state. We're currently second in the nation in geothermal energy production. Right now we produce a 450 megawatts net energy from geothermal. Realize that one megawatt produces enough energy for 750 to 1,000 homes. So you, then you can sort of do the numbers here, and Nevada produces enough geothermal energy for well over a million people. A lot of our geothermal energy is exported into California, but a lot of that does stay here in Nevada. So we have within the Bureau the Great Basin Center for Geothermal Energy, 
which is a, a research hub for geothermal. Our, that mission is to work in partnership with industry to establish geothermal energy as a sustainable, environmentally sound economic contributor. So we work on the geologic factors that uh, control geothermal activity. We develop new approaches to geothermal exploration. And as one example, we had a grant from the Department of Energy uh, to the tune of 2.8 million from 2014 to 2019 that culminated in the discovery of two new hidden geothermal systems. More than three quarters of our geothermal resources are hidden beneath the ground with no hot springs at the surface. So that map in the bottom of center is a geothermal potential map of about one third of the state. The warmer colors indicate the areas with higher potential. Uh, and the map on the right just shows uh, about 20 areas in the state that currently have geothermal power plants shown by the green circles. So um, to, to kind of summarize all of that information on natural resources, mineral resources, sources, various types of energy resources, the data from that, everything that we do is in the public domain. And so there's various types of data dissemination. There's digital databases as well as physical collections. And we house most of that in a library called the Great Basin Science Sample and Records Library. Uh, and that, that facility is very important for uh, economic development in the state. It saves industry and municipalities millions of dollars in terms of being sort of the repository for all of the geologic information across the state over, over the last 150 years or so. And then there's just some maps showing that that facility touches every state in the country in a given year and nearly every country in the world in a given year accesses uh, our databases online or, uh, or visits the, the facility uh, in person. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. It's actually a pleasure to uh, uh, be the state geologist for such a fascinating uh, uh, geologically speaking state. And one more little factoid that's kind of neat about the Nevada, we're actually the fastest growing state tectonically speaking. So we add about an acre or so per year to the state thanks to kind of the, 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 the tectonics, which also control all of our mineral and energy resources and make us a very special place for that. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much to both doctors. I had one question, and then I'm sure some of us on the committee have questions as well. And again, we really appreciate the presentation. I think I heard you say we might have the most geothermal resources, most geothermal rich, I guess, in the country, but we produce word number two in production. I was just curious who was number one. Uh, um, uh, Jim Falls, for the record, um, uh, Madam Chair, California is number one. Um, and where do they fall on their resources? compared to Nevada? In term, uh, Madam Chair, in terms of the amount of production? Mm -hmm. or, so they produce uh, on the order of, um, let me think, 2.5, so about 2,500 megawatts. So right now about five times what we produce. But by all, all sort of studies, we actually have more geothermal resources than California. They're, they're a little bit more spread out. In California, they're very focused in a few areas, so a little bit um, easier to develop, but ultimately, um, I think everyone would agree Nevada will probably produce more geothermal energy than California. So, Thank you. Very interesting. Do we have any questions from the committee? All right. Thank you so much to both of you and for your work with UNR. We thank you for the presentation, and with seeing no further questions, we are completed with the presentation portion, and we are going to move to public comments. As a reminder, public comment is limited to two minutes per person. However, feel free to submit any additional written comments to the secretary, and they will be added to the record. Is there any public comment here that does not have anything to do with Senate Bill 77 or 180 here in Carson City? Seeing everyone scared of the low seat, I understand. We'll move to BPS. Is there anyone on the phone who'd like to make public comment? Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. All right. With no further public comment, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much, and come back for a lot of water on Thursday. <laughs>